Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. It's been a while since I did a video that was just news, but there were a few stories that came up over the past week that I wanted to talk about and I'm hoping to do more of these kinds of videos in the future as well as dipping into some live stuff. We're really gonna try experimenting with some stuff here. But this week I wanted to talk about a couple of superhero movie stories, of course, because those are always grabbing headlines, as well as the beginning of the fall festival circuit and what that could mean for the Oscar race. But let's start with one of the most high profile movies that's coming out this year, which is Joker, Folly Adieu, the follow up to the smashing success of 2019's Joker, which grossed a billion dollars worldwide and won Joaquin Phoenix an Academy Award for Best Actor. Now, the second Joker film doesn't open until next month, but there are some alarm bells that are already ringing, indicating that it might have trouble replicating the runaway success of the original movie. Obviously hoping to get a jump on buzz and acclaim, Warner Brothers opted to screen the movie last week at the Venice Film Festival, and reviews matched the reception of the original film, which were mixed overall, with some skewing highly positive and some highly negative. Given that this has been pitched as an unorthodox sequel from the beginning, that's not a huge surprise, especially because the first Joker movie was also polarizing with mixed reviews, but the early reviews have not added to any of the hype as the movie approaches its opening weekend. Those who have seen the film have already flagged some potential issues, including the movie's musical sequences, which some audiences may not be prepared for, the movie's use or lack thereof of Lady Gaga, which some believe may disappoint her fans who show up to see the movie, as well as some choices in the film's story, which have been spoiled on the internet, but which I have no interest in finding out for myself because I would like to experience the movie for the first time in a theater. A bigger issue may be some early reports that have come out from independent box office analysts regarding the movie's ticket pre-sales. These analysts claim at this point in the process that Joker 2 is reportedly selling at a volume closer to The Flash and The Marvels than your typical blockbuster superhero movie. And while the second Joker film isn't atypical comic book movie stylistically, it reportedly carries a huge budget, as high as $200 million, which would be equal to your average MCU film. Now, director Todd Phillips has denied that the movie cost $200 million. He calls that figure absurd, but he has not denied that the movie has had a significant increase in budget, much higher than the original Joker movie's $55 million budget. It was reported this week that early tracking has Joker 2 opening in the $70 million range, which is steeply down from the $100 million plus dollar opening that many in the industry have been hyping for the last few months. But it should also be noted that early tracking indicated $70 million openings for both The Flash and The Marvels at this point leading into their release, a figure that they both significantly underperformed. So it seems like 70 million may just be the baseline for some tracking estimates that come through the industry trades. Now I've talked about box office tracking here on the channel before and how inaccurate it can be. A lot of it is based on an audience acting as expected and it may just be that the audience for Joker Folie Adieu is not your typical comic book movie audience, that they're not buying tickets in pre-sales at a volume that you would expect from a movie like this, and that things are gonna pick up closer to the release date. That is entirely possible. Atypical audience behavior is the villain for box office trackers. Should the second Joker film underperform expectations, it wouldn't be the first movie that isn't able to capture the lightning in a bottle that the original was able to have. The concern for me when it comes to box office is the elevated budget of the second movie, not necessarily what its numbers are gonna be when it opens, because when you have an increase in budget, especially two to three or more times, it does come with more expectation from both the consumer as well as the studio releasing the movie. In an interview with Variety, director Todd Phillips questioned the obsession over the movie's budget, saying, quote, I read these stories and it seems like they're on the side of the multinational corporations. They're like, why does it cost so much? They sound like studio executives. Shouldn't people be happy that we got this money out of them, meaning the studio, and we use it to hire a bunch of crew people who can then go feed their families? I respect what Todd Phillips is saying here because artistically, the box office gross doesn't change anything and he was able to employ a lot of people with the money that Warner Brothers gave them to make the film but I think that you also have to look at Warner Brothers as a studio much like the Joker series they are an atypical studio and should they take a big financial hit from the second movie, I could see it trickling down to other projects. That could mean budget cuts for other movies that also hire crew. It could mean other movies that are canceled altogether, which we've seen Warner Brothers do 
on more than one occasion. So I understand what Todd Phillips is saying, and I think that he's right in some aspects, but I also don't think that Joker 2 is in a bubble where its performance has no chance to affect other things down the line. Now, obviously none of this is set in stone, and I'll be tracking the box office numbers as they come in, as I always do here on the channel, but I think that the main takeaway at this point is that this second Joker movie, which was thought at one point to be one of the year's biggest surefire hits, is slowly turning into one of 2024's biggest question marks. All right, let's move on now to a story involving another superhero franchise, the Spider-Man franchise, and specifically Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, the third Spider-Verse film, which was originally on the release schedule for earlier this year, but was pushed off that schedule and hasn't yet gotten a new release date. And I wanna say up front that this is a bit of an uncomfortable story for me to cover because it involves somebody I know personally, and that person would be Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder is somebody who was involved in the Schmodown, who I played in the Schmodown multiple times. We have always been on friendly terms, but this story involves the entertainment media. It involves the way that scoops are used in the entertainment media, and that is a topic that we have covered here on the channel many, many times before. So even though I do have a relationship off camera with the main subject of the story, I still think that it merits discussion right here, and I will do my absolute best to be objective about what I'm talking about. On Monday, in a story in his subscriber newsletter speculating about the release date of Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, Jeff Snyder noted that he believed it would be unlikely that Sony would release both a live action and an animated Spider-Man film in 2026, because 2026 is reportedly the desired release year for Tom Holland's fourth Spider-Man movie, which he reported also would be directed by Destin Daniel Cretton. Now, in addition to what I think was a logical line of thinking, which is that the studio would likely want to split up its two main Spider-Man franchises, Jeff added another bit of information, which is really what took the internet by storm once his newsletter went out. He wrote, quote, over Labor Day weekend, I heard that Sony scrapped most of Beyond the Spider-Verse for creative reasons, and because of that decision, the movie would be unlikely to debut before 2027, given the detailed animation it requires. Now, I wanna be very clear that the point of the article that Jeff wrote was not that Spider-Verse had been partially scrapped, it was to talk about the new director for the next live action movie and to speculate as to when Beyond the Spider-Verse would be put on the release calendar. And Snyder has since clarified that he heard that parts of the movie had been scrapped over Labor Day weekend, not that the actual scrapping of the movie had occurred over Labor Day weekend. But nonetheless, that is a pretty provocative piece of information, and as happens, it soon made its way to social media and onto the news aggregator sites, which we've talked about here on the channel before, will misrepresent or distort information, either intentionally or unintentionally, in order to generate clicks for their site. Many of them reported that finished footage or even the entire movie had been scrapped, which the article did not state, and some said that it was definitively delayed until 2027, which also was not explicitly stated in the original article. Article, but it is fair to say and accurate that the article did state that at some point in time, most, and I'm using the word that was written in the article, quote, most of Beyond the Spider-Verse had been scrapped for creative reasons. On Tuesday, Spider-Verse composer Daniel Pemberton replied to a post from the movie news site discussing films saying, quote, would you ever believe that there could sometimes be stuff on the internet that might not always be particularly accurate? Pemberton's response sent off another flurry of posts on social media and in the movie news circles saying essentially that the original report had been false, that it was fake news, if you will, and some people began pointing their fingers at Jeff Snyder for circulating false information. And it was this response that led to a lot of activity from Jeff attempting to defend his original article. First came a post implying that Daniel Pemberton may not be telling the truth about the situation behind the scenes. The post read, don't really ever wanna weigh in on this sort of stuff, but as we know, we can all trust the Spider-Verse filmmakers to tell fans the truth about what's going on behind the scenes with a winky face emoji. That was followed by another post aimed at Pemberton asking if he'd read the original article or if he was just reacting to what Snyder believed were inaccurate headlines about the original story. Then Snyder attacked the website Cinema Blend, which in a story of its own, labeled the original report as false. Now I've had my own issues with Cinema Blend, which we've talked about here on the channel before, including its aggregation and sometimes its penchant for clickbait, but Snyder's response 
to that article, as well as his response to managing editor Sean O'Connell, who is a published author, was, um, let's say, a little aggressive and also implied once again that the people behind the movie may not be telling the truth. Snyder said, quote, Yeah, Sean, people in the film biz never lie, you effing moron. Go write another, let's say, poopy book filled with zero insight. Your site only exists because of the scoops that I and people like me break. You're another black hole aggregator on the internet farming for engagement clicks. Later on Tuesday, Spider-Verse producer Chris Miller responded to the rumors saying that, quote, Nothing has been scrapped. The reels are coming along nicely. Snyder responded to that tweet blaming aggregators again for misrepresenting his statements and asking for a status on the release date. When Variety picked up Miller's post and wrote a story about it, Snyder attacked Variety, saying, quote, Variety didn't even reach out for comment, which gives you an idea of how that publication is doing these days. They do zero reporting of their own here, just aggregation. Any insight into the mystery release date? None, which by the way, was the whole point of my story. When will we be able to see beyond? Not the scrapping, that was the internet's doing. So this is Snyder basically saying, hey, listen, I wrote a story about a release date being up in the air. I didn't write a story about scrapping. The internet took that and ran away with it, which is true, but also I think a bit of a dodge, which we'll talk about later. Shortly afterwards, Snyder implied that Chris Miller may also not be telling the truth about the status of the movie, saying, read this one closely, referring to one of his new articles, or just take the word of a producer whose job is to make you and the studio he's rumored to be leaving believe that everything is going smoothly. At the same time, Snyder also claimed that the fact that both Pemberton and Miller had responded to the rumors indicated that it was a sign that they were possibly true, at least in part. As the saga stretched into Wednesday, Snyder posted again apologizing to both Pemberton and Miller for attacking them in both the posts that remain on his account and some that were deleted, and said he stands by his original report, but should have let them speak for themselves without attacking them in return. Jeff further addressed the incident on a show that he does with my former Schmodown teammate, John Roca called the hot mic, where he continued to claim that the problem was that his original reporting was misrepresented. So it was basically aggregated by the internet as these yes. things are wont to do. Yes. But what happens is, is they read what I took hours to write, they read it in two minutes, and they spit it back out in five to ten minutes. It's a huge fucking game of telephone, and it's not my problem at all and also apologized again to Chris Miller and Daniel Pemberton. I apologize to both these guys because I crossed the line. I made it personal where they didn't. And to my former Schmodown partner's credit, he held Jeff Snyder's feet to the fire on their own show, pushing back against the fact that when you post provocative information, you can't exactly be surprised when they respond to being provoked. You can't play of it both course. ways. You can't look to poke the bear and then get sensitive when you get smacked back by the bear that's not how it works you've there's, got to be able to take and care. there's no question that i regret certain tweets so what's my take on this whole thing i've talked about scoops on this channel many times before and how they are often presented as fact, sometimes by the people who are out there doing the scooping but more often by the sites who are reporting on the reports and who do treat it like a game of telephone. Jeff Snyder's not wrong about that. That does happen a lot. And it's not to demean the work of the people that are out there doing this to say that sometimes the information is not true. A lot of times these scoops are right. Jeff, for example, was one of the first people to report ahead of the big Comic-Con announcement that Robert Downey Jr. may be rejoining the MCU as Doctor Doom. But scoops can sometimes be wrong, and they frequently are. That's not an insult to the people who are out there getting them. But sometimes the information is bad. Sometimes their sources have wrong information. Sometimes their sources have outdated information. And I think that's why you often don't see a lot of these scoops in the mainstream Hollywood trade publications. The trades depend on good relations with the studios in order to stay in business. So a lot of times they're not gonna report information that a studio might not want out there because they can't confirm it or because a studio said, wait a minute, no, you know, you're seriously going to damage your relationship with us if you report this. Now, a lot of the times that means that the trades are a mouthpiece for studios that are only reporting the information that studios want out there. And that's where the scoopers have the advantage. But sometimes that system is also a barrier to bad information not getting out there. Sometimes the fact that a trade won't report a scoop means that that information just isn't really that accurate and they're not gonna run that story. Jeff himself has said that he believes that his wording around 
what was scrapped and when it was scrapped was vague and that he wishes he could have clarified it a little more. But the reason that some language had to be chosen there is that he doesn't have the complete story. He only knows as much as his sources can give him. Sometimes that means that a scoop is completely wrong. Sometimes that means that a scoop is partially wrong. And sometimes it means that you are actually getting a piece of information before anybody else. But you have to trust those sources and you can't always or most of the time verify what they say. So there is some inherent risk involved. That's the nature of the beast if that's the sort of journalism that you're doing. You are marketing in unverified information with the trade-off being that if you are right or if your source is right, you will gain a reputation as somebody who knows more than anybody else. However, and I've said this many times before, journalists who market in scoops build a reputation on boosting up the times that they were right and hoping that people forget the times that they were wrong. And I have to give some credit to my old teammate, John Roca, because I think that he was right in the point that he was making on his show. You cannot market in provocative information and not expect a response to that information. Because the newsletter, really, if the story, if the focus was on speculation about when the movie was gonna be released, you could have left it at that. I think that Jeff Snyder 100% knew what he was doing when he added in the tidbit about most of the movie being scrapped for creative reasons. That is a provocative piece of information. And you have to know that it is going to generate interest, it's gonna generate attention, it's gonna generate a spotlight on you as a journalist and your work, but it may also generate a response from the people who are involved. Scooping is done at all levels of journalism and it comes with an inherent risk associated. And if somebody pushes back on your reporting and says that it's not true, I think you basically only have three options. Number one, you can say that it is true and provide some information to back that up. Number two, you can say, you know what, I was wrong and defer to the correction from whoever you were talking about. Or number three, if you can't prove the story just yet or if you don't have enough information, you can just let it lie and let time bear out whether you were right or wrong. And I think that Jeff Snyder could have chosen any one of those paths, but he didn't choose any of them. Did Jeff Snyder have a beef with some outlets? He absolutely did, because there was distortion out there of what he said, and people saying that he said things that he didn't say. And I get that. I do that on the channel all the time. A lot of times in the comments where somebody takes something that I said in a review, they'll snip it out of context, and they'll say, oh, so you're saying this? And it's a total misconstruction of what I actually said. And yeah, I will correct them. I get it. It's frustrating. But I would also argue that the Spider-Verse creators that responded were not reacting to, as Snyder said many times, inaccurate representations of what he wrote. I think that they were reacting to the actual words that were in the article, which said that, quote, Sony scrapped most of Beyond the Spider-Verse for creative reasons. Now, if that statement was too vague or misrepresented Snyder's intention, that's on him. He wrote those words and he said many times that he chooses his words very carefully. I don't think that you can pass the buck on that entirely. I think what we saw play out this week was a massive overreaction to a partially legitimate grievance. But looking at the bigger picture, where are we in the story at hand? At the end of all of this, we still don't know when Beyond the Spider-Verse is coming out, and we still don't know how much of it was scrapped, or if any of it was scrapped, or when some of it may have been scrapped. And so at the end of the road for this story, as is the case for what seems like media across every form of journalism, what we're left with is a whole lot of noise and very little actual information. We've got more to get to, but before we do, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, Miracle Made. Did you ever read one of those true facts that you wish you could just unhear? Well, here's one for you. Did you know that traditional sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? If you're cool with that, no judgment, but if you find that slightly terrifying, it may be time to give Miracle Made sheets a try. Miracle Made offers self cleaning antibacterial bedding like sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent up to 99.7% of bacteria growth and that require up to three times less laundry. And on top of that, they're also self cooling and very luxurious. 
I have Miracle Made sheets on my bed right now, and their silver infused fabrics mean that they'll stay on my bed longer than typical sheets. With Miracle Made, I'm getting a great night's sleep, and I'm not sleeping on bacteria, which can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Every night, I can drift off to sleep knowing that I'm sleeping well and I'm sleeping clean. Go to TryMiracle.com slash Dan to try Miracle Made sheets today, and whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code Dan at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan and use the code Dan to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring this video. All right, I'd like to wrap things up by talking about the fall film festival circuit, which is very much underway. First up, we have the Venice Film Festival, which held its awards ceremony last Saturday, and the winner of the top prize, The Golden Lion, was Pedro Almodovar's The Room Next Door, his first English language film about a woman played by Tilda Swinton and an old friend played by Julianne Moore who reunite after many years apart. Reviews have been positive so far, but The Golden Lion has a spotty track record when it comes to predicting Oscar gold. It's been about 50-50 in recent years. Still, as hard as this is to believe, The Room Next Door was the first film directed by Pedro Almodovar to win the top prize at a major film festival, which is both great news for the director and I think long overdue. The Best Director or Silver Lion Prize went to Brady Corbett for his film The Brutalist, a three-plus hour film starring Adrian Brody as a Holocaust survivor who immigrates to the United States. Corbett's last film was 2018's Vox Lux, which made my 2018 top 10 list that year, and early reviews have been strong for The Brutalist, so it should be on your awards radar. The Volpe Cup for Best Actor went to Vincent Linden for his role in the French film The Quiet Sun, while the Volpe Cup for for Best Actress went to Nicole Kidman for her role in A24's Baby Girl. Unfortunately, Kidman was not present to accept due to the death of her mother, but her win cements her early prominence in the Best Actress race this year. Across the pond, the Toronto International Film Festival wraps up today with the crowning of its coveted Toronto International Film Festival People's Choice Award. The Toronto Film Fest is unique on the festival circuit in that its top prize is awarded by the audience, the people that actually go see the movies and not a juried panel. And there is a stellar recent history of movies winning the People's Choice Award at Toronto going on to compete for Best Picture. As a matter of fact, since 2012, all 12 People's Choice Award winners have competed for the top prize at the Oscars, and four of the 12 have won Best Picture. So to win People's Choice at Toronto is a big deal for Oscar hopefuls. And the winner of the People's Choice Award, which was announced earlier today, was a surprise to many. Mike Flanagan's The Life of Chuck walked away with the award. The Life of Chuck is based on a non-horror, more sci-fi themed Stephen King novella, starring Tom Hiddleston as a man named Chuck, whose life story is told in reverse, with Jacob Tremblay playing the younger version of the character, and Chiwetel Ejiofor, Karen Gillan and Mark Hamill also starring in the movie. The Life of Chuck was a world premiere at the festival and doesn't currently have a release date, but this is a massive boost to its visibility and awards chances. This was honestly not on a lot of awards radars to this point, certainly not on mine, but I am a big fan of Mike Flanagan and I'm happy to see his work get this kind of recognition. The Life of Chuck beat out several higher profile films, including Anora, which is still generating massive buzz off its Palm d'Or win at Cannes, just this summer, and won second runner-up for the Audience Award. The first runner-up was Emilia Perez continuing its momentum off a joint Best Actress prize for its leads at Cannes. A few other high-profile films that did well at Toronto include Saturday Night, Jason Reitman's look at the early days of SNL, and my most anticipated film of the fall, which received an incredibly positive response when it debuted. DreamWorks Animation's The Wild Robot has also received nearly unanimous praise so far as it tries to establish itself as a front runner for the Best Animated Feature Oscar, and The Substance, starring Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley, also received positive reviews for both the movie and its stars. Those are just a few of the standout films from Toronto, and you can stay tuned to the channel because I will be covering a lot of the movies in the coming weeks, including The Substance, which I'm going to be reviewing right here on the channel this upcoming week, and then next week, which will have reviews for The Wild Robot, as well as Francis Ford Coppola's 
Megalopolis, which may not be an awards contender, but is certainly one of the curiosities of the fall. And that does it for today's news roundup. Stay tuned right here on the channel. Tomorrow, I'm going to have a recap of the Emmys, which are airing tonight. It's the second Emmy Awards ceremony of the year because the 2023 ceremony was pushed into early this year because of the strike. Spoiler alert, get ready for the Bear and Shogun to win almost everything. Then on Tuesday, I'm going to have charts with Dan, and I'll have some reviews later this week, including The Substance as well as Transformers 1. So we're really picking things up here on the channel. Thank you so much to everybody who's watched and who's been hanging in there as I get settled into this new space. And of course, as always, thanks for spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.